I'm Andrew Jackson. I'm the Economic Geologist with Global Resource Investments, and I'm responsible for technical evaluations of the mineral companies and their properties that Global invests in. I put together this Ore Deposits 101 series of talks to help non-technical people understand ore deposits. The talks highlight some of the features of the main deposit types that investors in the resource sector may come across and provide an introduction, introduction to the jargon that you will find in press releases put out by exploration and mining companies. This is the eighth in the Ore Deposit 101 series of talks and today we're going to talk about the biggest elephants of all in the world of giant ore uh, gold ore deposits, the Vitvatasrand gold deposits. I thought it might be interesting to start off today's talk with a bit of history and run through the events that led up to the discovery of the Vitvatasrand gold fields. I'll show how, except for a fluke of nature, they might never have been discovered. I'll also try to justify the claim that these are the biggest elephants of all. Then we come to one of the greatest controversies in the uh, geological world, the genesis of the ore deposits. I'll talk about the two main competing theories of origin and then offer a third possibility. Then a short section on how these remarkable deposits are mined and the technical and social issues involved, which will lead us on to the last section, what is the future of the Vitvatasrand gold industry? So first, let's skim through the history of South Africa since the arrival of the Dutch in the southernmost tip of the continent in 1652. The Dutch set up a small fort where Cape Town stands today and started market gardens as a place for the Dutch East India Company's ships to shelter and to restock with fresh water and provisions on the long journey between Holland and the East Indies. The East Indies uh, was a vital tra spice trading um, destination for the Dutch. As time went on, the tiny community expanded and some of the Dutch were allowed to move into the surrounding area to set up new farms on the condition that they still sell their produce to the Dutch East India Company to supply the expanding traffic, uh, ship traffic. This arrangement, although it was very successful, only lasted for a fairly short time before these farmers, or boars as they became known, became frustrated by the restrictions set by the company and they started breaking free of the bond and moving inland in their wagons with the Bible in one hand and the rifle in the other. Towards the end of the 1700s, the global influence of the Dutch began to fade and the British moved uh, to fill the vacuum that they left. By 1815, British sovereignty of the Cape was recognized by other European nations. The influx of British settlers and the imposition of British law infuriated the Boers and they began moving east to escape the British influence. Although much of the area that they moved into was pretty inhospitable, they were still a tough group and they thrived there. In 1820, <coughs> the British began the settlement of the Eastern Cape, initially as a way of providing a buffer between the advancing Dutch settlers and the indigenous Poser tribes to the east. This idea failed, but the British were there to stay and they rapidly expanded up the east coast to Natal and then inland. Hemmed in by the British to the west and east and by the ocean to the south, the Boers climbed into their wagons again and they headed north and northeast, seeking new horizons where they could live their lives free of the hated British. They crossed the Orange and the Vaal rivers and set up two new Boer republics, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal Boer Republic, electing their own presidents. In 1866, a large diamond was discovered on the banks of the Orange River in unclaimed land near the border with the Orange Free State. Three years later, an even bigger one was found some miles away 
on a small rocky hill known as Coleman's Cop. Within months of word getting out, there had been a huge diamond rush, and by 1870, the area was blanketed by more than 800 claims. The Cape Colony, the Transvaal, the Orange Free State, and the local indigenous leader from the Griqua tribe all laid claim to the area. The courts awarded the mineral rights to the indigenous leader. He then placed himself under British protection, and in 1871, the area was proclaimed part of the, Britain, of the Cape Province. Within two years, a thriving tent and wooden shack city that became known as Kimberley had sprung up, with thousands of miners working tiny claims by hand, hauling the ore out of the pit on a spider's web of cable hoists. Cecil Rhodes arrived in South Africa from England in 1870 to help on his brother's farm in Natal. But within a year, he'd given up the farming and he joined the rush for Kimberley's diamonds. Over the next 17 years, he steadily brought out all the small claim owners until he achieved a monopoly. De Beers Consolidated Mines was established in 1888, but long before that, thousands of prospectors and miners who had arrived at the Kimberley diggings too late to stake a claim for themselves had moved on in search of the next Kimberley or El Dorado. But where was that next uh, opportunity? North of Kimberley, towards the Kalahari Desert, the land became drier and more inhospitable. So most prospectors fanned out to the northeast and the east of Kimberley, into the Transvaal Boer Republic. Steadily new discoveries were made, not of diamonds this time, but of gold. Armed with their prospecting pans, the new wave of fortune hunters crushed and panned any quartz veins they could see looking for telltale flakes of gold. By 1870, gold had been discovered in the Murchison, in the north of the Transvaal. A year later, at Easterling, and in 1873, in the mountains around uh, Sabi and Pilgrim's Rest. And in 1881, the Barberton Green Goldfield was discovered. <clears throat> now, most of these gold discoveries were of what we now call shear zone hosted greenstone gold deposits quartz veins in greenstone belts. And at each of these places, the same tent and shack towns sprung up, and word went out drawing the fortune hunters and the losers who had arrived too late to cash in on the last previous on the previous discoveries. One of these down on his luck diggers, an Australian called George Harrison, arrived in Kimberley when Rhodes had already tied up most of the diamond diggings. Unable or unwilling to work in Kimberley for a pittance, he decided to walk 500 miles to the new gold discoveries in the eastern Transvaal. He set out from Kimberley early in 1886, travelling through the Transvaal Republic, prospecting and panning the streams as he went. His route took him over the, the, the open grassland of the Highfelt, with its scattered Boer farmsteads, including one called Langlachta, or Long Valley, named after a valley that ran parallel to a barren quartzite ridge. There, on a Sunday morning in March, he spied an outcrop of an unusual rock. It was a pebbly conglomerate. Now, there were no quartz veins of the sort that were usually associated with gold in his native Australia or the new discoveries in the eastern Transvaal. But he knocked off a piece of it anyway, and he noticed, among the partially oxidized pyrite, the gleam of gold. He went to the local Transvaal Republic government offices and lodged a claim. <clears throat> Once word got out, he sold his claim for ten pounds and then he continued his trip to the eastern Transvaal goldfields, his original target. He was never heard of again. There's a statue of George Harrison on the site of his discovery in what is now one of the southern suburbs of Johannesburg. It shows a rather romanticized view of Harrison holding up a lump of rock, perhaps shouting Eureka. More likely he was muttered, doesn't look much good, but I may, may be able to flog the claim to some idiot so I can buy enough food to get me to Barberton. But the staking of that claim next to the Ridge Whitewaters, or Witwatersrand, 
was the start of the greatest gold field in the history of the world. In a matter of few years, the area went from a barren wasteland through tent city to shacks to brick buildings to a bustling metrop metropolis with its own uh, stock exchange and secondary industries. <coughs> Within 10 years, it had outstripped Cape Town as the biggest city in, in Africa, south of the equator, a position that still holds today. The original outcrop of the reef runs under the low buildings in the foreground of this picture of Johannesburg, with the tall Hillbrow Tower at back left, built on the ridge of white waters. So much for the discovery of the Vatvatashant gold fields. <clears throat> Let me try to convey now just how big and significant these really are. As penny stock investors, we're very familiar with vein-type gold deposits that may be a few meters thick with a strike of a couple of hundred meters to a couple of kilometers. Such a deposit might contain anything from 100,000 ounces to 10 million ounces of gold. But when we think of an example of a huge deposit, we might turn to a monster such as Bingham Canyon in Utah. Bingham is a very large porphyry deposit with an open pit that dwarfs the giant haul trucks that transport ore to the input rail system. The ore body at Bingham <clears throat> is 2.8 kilometers long and the pit is 3.5 kilometers in diameter. It's truly a marvel of engineering. But now let's take Bingham's footprint and superimpose it on a plan of the Val Reefs mine in, in, in the Witwatersrand at the same scale. The grey areas are those that have already been mined out. The orange and dark red areas are those areas of reef that have yet to be mined. You can see that we could fit approximately 10 Bingham deposits into the Val Reefs deposit. Of course, the Vatvatastron deposits are only thin layers, whereas Bingham deposit extends to depth, so the comparison isn't quite fair. However, the Val Reefs is only a part of the Clarksdorp goldfield. And if we then take the Val Reef footprint and superimpose it on the outline of the Clarksdorp goldfield at the same scale, we begin to see the real extent of the mineralization. The Clarksdorp goldfield is 35 kilometers long and 20 kilometers wide. But the Clarksdorp goldfield is only a part of the Witwatersrand gold system. And if we superimpose the gold field on a geology map of the entire Vitz, we can see that it's just one of several gold fields, marked in blue, along the rim of the Witwatersrand basin. The other gold fields are Velkom in the southwest, Carltonville, uh, Johannesburg, the site of George Harrison's original discovery, East Rand gold fields, and the Evander Goldfield in the extreme east. The Coltonville, Johannesburg and East Rand Goldfields are basically contiguous, with mineralization extending virtually continuously over a strike length of 150 kilometers. The Witwatersrand deposits have produced almost 40% of all the gold produced on Earth since the beginning of time. Over 1.5 billion, with a B, ounces. That's the equivalent of 300 5 million ounce deposits. If there's one area of agreement on the Witwatersrand gold deposits, it's that they are truly world-class solid gold elk firms. But now we come to the genesis of the Witwatersrand gold deposits, and that is mired in disagreement. And it has been ever since they were first discovered 125 years ago. The genesis of these deposits is one of the biggest controversies ever in ore deposit geology, with two camps, the Paleoplacerists and the Epigeneticists shooting at each other from their trenches and few people risking venturing out into no man's land between them. Before we look at the two opposing theories, let's look at what is agreed upon by both camps. 
The rocks of the Witwatersrand are between 2.9 and 2.72 billion years old. That puts them at the tail end of the Archean. Even though the style of the basin is more like that of a Proterozoic sedimentary basin. This end of Archean age of the Witwatersrand means that it was being deposited at a time when a large proportion of the Earth's greenstone belts were also being deposited. The Witwatersrand supergroup is sandwiched between the underlying basement gneisses and Dominion group and the overlying Fentersdorp, Mafic Volcanics and Transvaal groups. So the history can be interpreted as follows. Formation of an early granite greenstone terrain, similar in style to parts of the Western Australian, Zimbabwe and Canadian cratons. A period of deformation, uplift and erosion to develop an unconformity. Extension and rifting to form the new Dominion Group basin. Submarine ba basalts erupted from the faults and, and the basin was then partly filled with fine argillaceous sediments washed in from either side for up to a maximum thickness of 7,000 feet. Another period of rifting deepened the basin further, allowing 16,000 feet of mixed shales and arcoses, the so-called Westrand group, <coughs> to be deposited. Towards the end of this phase of sedimentation, the basin was filled, allowing occasional development of shallow water sediments such as conglomerates. At the end of the West Rand group sedimentation, there was thrusting from the northwest that uplifted the basement gneisses to produce highlands around the north and west margins of the basin. Erosion of these highlands led to the deposition of 7,000 feet of the central Rand group. And as you will see, the central Rand group is central to the story. Let's run through a conceptual section of through the, across the basin. You can see the Dominion group in green being deposited underwater on the pink basement, followed by the West Rand group in grey, and then the development of thrust from the northwest, pushing up the basement and some of the West Rand sediments to form a range of mountains near the shoreline. As uplift pushed up those highlands, the Nysic basement was eroded into the basin, forming the coarse Central Rand group. These sediments were laid down in fluvial channels, just above sea level or in shallow water conditions. The dominantly quartzitic is actually surprisingly little feldspar preserved from the granites that were eroded into it. And the, it, it varies, the, the sediment varies from fine sandstones to coarse conglomerates, with the conglomerates forming alluvial fans around the mouths of the rivers. The outcrop of conglomerate that Harrison stumbled upon that fateful Sunday morning is one of these. Here is a plan view of this process, with the outline of the West Rand group sediments in beige. Firstly, the thrusting from the northwest that forms an arc of thrust along the margin of the basin. And the erosion of the highlands and the deposition of the sandstones of the yellow central Rand group. This is an iterative process with numerous movements of the thrust and periods of uplift, leading to cyclical de deposition of sandstone and conglomerate. The conglomerates were for formed, uh, formed alluvial fans along the mouths of the eroding rivers, where they were subject to wave action along the shore, which winnowed out the fines, leaving the lenses of coarse, clean pebbles. The sandstones and conglomerates of the central Rand group barely had time to settle before the compression and the resulting thrusting suddenly stopped and the region went into very rapid extension again, forming rifts into which some 6,000 feet of basaltic volcanics poured to form the Fentersdorp group and completely burying the central Rand sandstones and spreading out well beyond the edge of the original basin. This is a very dramatic event and happened in an incredibly short period of time. Geologically speaking, you could say it happened on a Tuesday. Back to our section. There are the Fentersdorp lavas being laid down. 
There was a short break in activity following the, the deposition of the, the Fentestorp lavas, which allowed a minor amount of erosion to take place before the area began to subside under the weight of the sediments and volcanics. The sea once again invaded, and de deposition of the 40,000 foot thick Transvaal supergroup sediments began. Later there was renewed thrusting from the northwest. Power sequence. Some of the thrusting was along old thrusts and some along newly developed structures. That folding was followed by another very, very long period of erosion that stripped off most of the Transvaal sediments and then more recently by the deposition of the Karoo sequence and then yet again yet another long period of erosion resulting in the landscape we see today so a lot has happened in this part of the world in the last three billion years but you're probably saying by now this is all very interesting but what about the gold where does that fit into the story well if we take a look at how the gold is distributed within the stratigraphic column we see that 95 percent of the gold is mined from the bits has come from the central RAM group. And more than 90% of that gold is hosted in just a few thin conglomerate units in the orange fans on the map. And most of these mineralized conglomerate beds are only 20 to 30 centimeters or 8 to 12 inches thick, a truly remarkable concentration of gold. At this point, I'd like to take a short detour to show just how close the mining industry came to never discovering the Witwatersrand gold fields. As you can see on the map, the economically mineralized gold fields in blue around the margins of the, the basin make up only a small percentage of the total area of the Witwatersrand basin, which is the yellows and beiges. Moreover, the vast majority of the Wits basin is covered by a thick, thick sequences of younger Transvaal or Karoo sediments and does not outcrop. Only three small nail pairings of Witz rocks actually outcrop and only one of those coincides with the mineralized portion of the stratigraphy. If the erosion level were just a few hundred meters higher that small patch of mineralized rock would still be buried and the Witwatersrand gold fields would not have been discovered. The economic engine that drove the subcontinent for over a hundred years would be just a bare ridge overlooking open felt and being farmed by some old Afri Afrikaners uh, on, in the Transvaal Republic. But now let's look in more detail where the gold lies within those conglomerates. The bulk of the pebbles and sand grains in the conglomerates were derived from ero erosion of white or grey quartz veins. And most of the gold occurs as grains or fillings of fine fractures, both between the grains and cross-cutting the pebbles. Although the ore looks flashy in hand specimen, rich in shiny yellow pyrite, the gold itself is generally fine and you don't often see it with the naked eye. Under the microscope, most of the gold grains are fairly angular rather than rounded. One exception to this pattern is the so-called carbon leader, which is a narrow seam of bedding parallel carbon with exceptionally high gold grades. The gold is often visible in this unit and the carbon leader may also contain high uranium values which can be economically extracted. Okay, so there's no major controversy so far. Both camps agree broadly on the stratigraphy, the tectonics and deformation, and the distribution of the gold in the central rand. So where is the controversy? <clears throat> Simply put, it's about how the gold got there. That controversy has raged virtually since the gold was first discovered in 1886, a period of over 125 years. As I mentioned, there are two main schools of thought. Those that think the mineralization is an alluvial placid deposit, somewhat uh, modified by later metamorphism, and those that believe that the mineralization was introduced by hydrothermal solutions, epigenetically, 
i.e. some time after the deposition of the host rocks. As you would imagine, both theories have good evidence both for and against them. As we saw earlier, the Vitvatatron gold is generally in the central rand group, the youngest part of the bits. The central rand group was deposited during the biggest pulse of gold mineralization in greenstone belts around the world. Both theories hold that there is a connection of some sort between the Witz gold and the greenstone belt mineralization, but the nature of that connection is where they differ. <coughs> the modified Plasser model calls on the, ero on the erosion of an older mineralized greenstone terrain to the northwest of the basin as a source of alluvial gold washed down the rivers and into the alluvial fans around the basin margin, where the fine silty portion of the sediment was winnowed out and removed by wave action and wind, leaving the heavy gold and coarser well-rounded quartz vein pebbles concentrated along the ancient shoreline. Long after burial, metamorphism and deformation remobilized some of the gold into cracks in the rock. The carbon-rich carbon leader is explained as being an old algal mat that trapped the alluvial gold that was washing over it and was subsequently metamorphosed to graphite. It's a simple and easily envisaged model. What's the evidence supporting that uh, modified passer model? Firstly, the gold has a strong spatial association with well-sorted, clean, pebbly conglomerates, typical, typical of those found in modern placer deposits. The gold is often channelized, as in modern placer deposits. Additionally, it's often associated with other heavy minerals, such as water-rounded zircons and chromite, like those you see on modern beaches. Rounded pyrite grains are, are common in the Witz, but they're seldom seen in modern placers. This is explained by the low levels of atmospheric oxygen in the Archean. A few of the gold grains appear to have been flattened <coughs> with curled edges as they are in a modern day placer. As we have often seen, the Witz gold mineralization is generally very laterally extensive and widely consistent in grade and thickness, much more, th more so than most hydrothermal deposits would be. Finally, there's some isotopic data which indicates that at least a small portion of the gold is older than the Witwatersrand basin sediments, and so it must have been introduced when, from the erosion of older rocks outside of the basin. What about the opposing hydrothermal model? <clears throat> How do the proponents of that theory explain the concentration of gold? They believe that the vast majority of the gold did not wash into the basin from the northwest, but that it came from a deep source beneath the central rand. Being epigenetic, it was introduced or concentrated long after the deposition of the host sediments, either during the metamorphism of the Witz sediments themselves, or from a magmatic source at depth or around the rim. As in the greenstone gold deposits, they postulate that the gold was transported as a bisulfide complex in hot hydrothermal solutions. They explain the spatial relationship with the conglomerates as being due to the highly porous nature of the conglomerates, which acted as an aquifer for the hydrothermal fluids. As in the case of the greenstone belt mineralization, the gold would have dropped out of solution when a reductant in the form of either carbon or pyrite was encountered. So if we return to our cartoon cross-section of the Witz Basin to summarize the hydrothermal model, the gold is postulated to have been introduced after the deposition of the host rocks, either from the deeper parts of the basin or along the thrust faults. In either case, the fluids were channeled along the most porous beds in the stratigraphy, the conglomerates and the coarser sandstones of the central Rand group. What evidence supports the hydrothermal model? <clears throat> Firstly, although the gold is generally found in the coarser fraction of modern placers, the size of the gold grains in the bits suggests that they should be associated with their hydraulic equivalents 
which would be coarse sandstones rather than the conglomerates that we find them in, suggesting that the gold was not deposited as grains carried by running water. In addition, the majority of the gold cross-cuts sedimentary features. Also, there is a good spatial correlation between the observed philic or hydrothermal alteration, <coughs> which even the plasterists concede as hydrothermal, and the gold. Most critically, however, the amount of gold in the Witz Basin is an order of magnitude greater than the amount of gold in any Archean craton anywhere else in the world. This makes it difficult to call upon the erosion of a typical Archean terrain to the northwest to supply that amount of gold. If it didn't come from there, they argue, it must have come from below. Finally, in other sedimentary basins with the similar sources of sediment, such as Elliott Lake in Canada, Jacobina in Brazil, or the Tarquean in West Africa, they don't have nearly the same amount of gold mineralization, but then they are fractionally younger. So let's summarize the situation. There's been a historical bias towards the easily understood modified Placer model. But there's been a resurgence of the hydrothermal model in recent years. Sedimentological analysis has proved very successful in locating and predicting mineralization, which leads, lends credence to the Placer theory. However, the very large non vitz deposits most very large non vitz deposits, are demonstrably hydrothermal in nature. There's absolutely no evidence to show that the terrain to the northwest hosted any outrageously extensive greenstone gold mineralization as a possible source for the placers. Working against the hydrothermalists is evidence that some gold predates the Witz Basin. So we have two entrenched opposing camps with no willingness to compromise. My own opinion is that both camps are right and both are wrong. I believe that a compromise model, applying our recently improved understanding of gold mineralization processes and using elements borrowed from both viewpoints, makes the most logical sense. To my mind, there are three really critical facts that have to be accounted for in any model. Firstly, there's too much gold in the Witz Basin to call on an eroded greenstone terrain as a sole source. Secondly, the Central Rand Group was deposited at the same time as one of the two biggest pulses of hydrothermal gold mineralization in the Earth's history. The other was in the tertiary. In part four of the Ore Deposits 101 series, I described a working theory whereby the sudden onset of crustal shortening at this time in the Earth's history resulted in massive partial melting of the deep crust under the cratons. This melt provided the source of gold for the greenstone belt deposits. Other similar basins, such as Elliott Lake and Jacobina and the Tarquern, are fractionally younger, <clears throat> and they would have missed out on this flush of gold from the lower crust. The third critical fact is that the sedimentological model has proved to be the most reliable predictor of gold mineralization in the mines for the last hundred years. Now because of the inability of any greenstone terrain to supply enough eroded gold to produce the volume found in the bits, I'm forced to conclude that the gold was originally in introduced hydrothermally either from below or laterally. And because the timing is synchronous with the greenstone belt mineralization elsewhere in the world, the path of least astonishment is that the mineralizing fluids were probably similar in nature and derived from the same deep crustal source area as the fluids that mineralize greenstone belts all over the world. So returning to this well-worn slide, we're dealing with a source fluid that has been generated by partial melting of deep crustal material with the gold being concentrated as the melt rises and cools in the same way as the greenstone mesothermal gold. However, whereas the, the fluids in the greenstone environment encountered either relatively impermeable volcanics or metamorpho sediments that forced the fluids to travel along tight structures, in the case of the Witz, 
The fluids encountered beautifully permeable, permeable and continuous conglomerates and sandstones, allowing them to flow freely, almost horizontally, and deposit gold widely over large areas before reaching the surface as epithermals. We had in effect a series of very, very large mesothermal and epithermal systems. The onset of thrusting to the northwest of the Witz Basin <coughs> coincided with the onset of major th thrusting in many other parts of the Earth. And also with the start of the deposition of the central Rand group sediments. The thrusting thickened the crust, causing partial melting of the deepest portions. That melt rose up through the crust, and as it cooled and crystallized at depth, produ produced the gold-rich hydrothermal fluid. The thrust fluid faults provided the best plumbing to get the melt and the fluids from the deep crust through the basement and into the Witz Basin. Once the fluids reached the permeable central rand group, they acted like any groundwater and flowed down the hydro hydrological gradient following the most permeable beds. And the most permeable beds were the newly deposited conglomerates. As we can see from this table of uh, permeability, shales like those in the underlying West Rand group have a hydraulic conductivity of 10 to the minus 4. Sandstones, like the majority of the central rand, have a permeability of about 10 to the minus 1. But clean gravels, similar to the Witz conglomerates, have a hydraulic conductivity of 10 to the plus 1. In other words, Conglomerates are a hundred times as permeable as the surrounding sandstones and 10,000 times as permeable as the shales. So we know where the fluids would have gone. As the pressure in the rising fluids dropped, they boiled and cooled and precipitated gold out of solution, just like in the deeper parts of modern day epithermal deposits. Eventually the gold charged fluids reached the surface either via the daylighting thrust faults or where the conglomerates uh, horizons came to surface, forming an arc of epithermal systems around the rim of the basin. River erosion and wave action continually reworked those epithermal deposits and concentrated the gold in second or third generation conglomerate deposits, just as the placerists describe. A modern example of this can be seen on the Italian coast where a small epithermal deposit is being eroded and depositing gold on the adjacent beach. I was initially concerned that the central rand sediments don't have class of banded epithermal style veins or sinter, but since then I've walked downstream from a number of eroding epithermal deposits and found that epithermal veins and sinters don't transport at all well and they're rapidly reduced to fine silt. Then much later after the central rand group had been buried by the Fentestorp uh, lavas and Transvaal sediments, the mineralization was metamorphosed and minor redistribu redistribution of the gold occurred, as the modified plasterists called for. Now with this hybrid model, the difficulty of finding a source for the gold in the surrounding greenstone terrain is removed and the method of deposition of the gold in the central rand group is resolved while still providing an exp explanation for the stratigraphic control to the mineralization that is so well proven in the Witz mines. In the same way as epithermals and porphyries are clearly genetically linked, in the Witwatersrand deposits I suggest that we're looking at hybrid deposits containing elements not only of mesothermal and epithermal deposits, but also of placer deposits. Now we have an idea of the layout and form of the Witwatersrand gold reefs. Let's move on to discuss briefly how the gold is mined. As I mentioned earlier, the gold is predominantly hosted in 20 to 30 centimeter thick conglomerate units 
that dip towards the center of the basin at 20 to 40 degrees. The reefs obviously cannot be mined to this narrow width, and most stopes are just over one meter in height, which means that there is significant dilution of the ore by waste. But importantly, it means that a high degree of manual labor is required, which is costly, both in monetary and social terms. The, the usual mining method used is long wall mining, which is similar to the method used in coal mining. Research has been going on for many years to try to automate the mining, but results so far have been very limited. The ore is simply too hard for coal cutters, and the need for blasting prevents a continuous mining approach. An exception to this narrow stope mining is at Goldfield's South Deep Deposit, where a series of reefs converge and a much thicker package, up to 30 meters thick, although somewhat lower in grade, allows mechanized cut and fill stoping. The Vitvatesrand mines are the deepest in the world, around 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet. Shaft sinking to service these depths is very expensive and time-consuming. The twin shafts at South Deep took nine years to sink and cost six hundred million dollars. Today the cost would probably be two or three times that. Also because of the dip, some of the deeper mines are now mining 15 kilometers down dip from the original outcrop and the daily commute from surface to the workplace may take two hours each way. This obviously leads to huge inefficiencies and discomfort for the uh, labor force. The extreme depths lead to great operational difficulties with pressure, pressure bursts and rock temperatures of 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees centigrade. So that specialized engineering techniques and refrigeration of uh, ventilation, air and water is necessary. In spite of the refrigeration, uh, work conditions are extremely tough. Lately there's been labor unrest in South Africa, with miners pro protesting their low pay for the very hard work. Unfortunately the mines are operating in an increasingly small, with an increasingly small margin, and when forced to raise salaries they have no choice but to close down unprofitable shafts. That has led to more unrest and threats of nationalization of the mines by the more extreme members of the ruling party. Faced with the risk of nationalization, most companies are coming to the conclusion that they cannot commit to the cost and the time involved in sinking any new shafts. The South African gold and platinum inter is industries as well are, if you'll excuse the pun, caught between a rock and a hard place. And this brings us to the last section of this talk. The future of the Witwatersrand gold mines. This financial, social and political squeeze has been going on for many years now, and this is reflected in South Africa's steadily shrinking share of the world gold production, from a dominant 70% in the 1960s down to just 7% in 2011. So do the South African Witwatersrand goldfields have a future? South Africa still has about 1.2 billion ounces in reserves, almost 50% of the world's reserves. However, a combination of factors is steadily increasing costs and risks so that the vast majority of these reserves are likely to become uneconomical and figuratively evaporate. These factors include ever deeper mining with associated rising costs and technical risks. A union-driven workforce that has shown that it can bring the industry to a halt in support of wage claims. A restive and underprivileged national population which is being told by certain politicians that nationalization of the mines will benefit them. Power shortages that will continue to plague this country and the mines for the next few years before additional capacity can be brought online. As a result, production is likely to continue to slide 
and a significant number of shafts and mines will continue to shut down over the next few years. My inescapable conclusion is that although the Vitz is the biggest elephant of, the, of them all, it's moving inexorably towards extinction. Unless, unless a new remote mining technologies can be developed to allow low-cost automated mining of very narrow stopes. Development of these technologies would go a long way towards allowing continued mining of the existing reserves. I have great faith that the lure of that much gold will eventually lead to a technological breakthrough. That would in turn solve a lot of the social issues. <clears throat> there would be far few, fewer people working underground, allowing less chance of accidents and better working conditions. For example, uh, the ability to work from air-conditioned operating stations. The political issue remains the wild card. So let's recap the main learning points from this talk. The Vitvatestrand has been the biggest producer of gold in the world by far. In spite of a lot of effort around the world to find another Vitz, this hasn't happened, and I doubt whether there is one. The origin of the gold is controversial, <clears throat> with two schools of thought, the modified Paleoplasa origin and the epigenetic hydrothermal origin. I personally believe that the log logic dictates that the truth lies in a combination of both processes. There are huge reserve, gold reserves and resources still remaining. Almost half of the world's gold reserves still lie unmined in the Vitvatosram Basin. But these are generally too deep for juniors to mine or explore for. They are the domain of the mining majors. In recent years, we've seen several smaller companies try to mine or explore for Vitz deposits, but ending up bankrupt and stepping away from the environment. Juniors are out of their depth in the Vitz, both literally and metaphorically. The Vitvatostrand Basin's contribution to world gold production will continue to wane due to both macro and microeconomic factors. With the decline of this huge source of gold production, and even with uh, China's gold production accelerating rapidly, I believe that world peak gold has passed. I believe that new technologies will be found to allow remote mechanized mining, but whether this will reverse the trend remains to be seen. That is ultimately in the hands of the politicians. That's the end of this talk. Thank you for watching. In the next talk on the Ore Deposits 101 series, I'll cover uranium deposits and copper roll front deposits. <laughs>